I'm live! Sudden attack of stage fright. Do I have some stage fright? Yes! I'm so, I'm terrified. Mac DSP is here. Oh, if you're going to be here, you can give away things. <laughs> See how that works? Three, two, one. Hello in Argentina. Well, firstly, where is everybody today? And how are you all? Yes, I'm glad you entertain yourselves. So we seem to have this, we seem to have this thing where every time we start a stream, we'll fire it up and YouTube has this, you know, um, little helpful, uh, um, what do they call it? They call it, uh, I don't know. It's some, you know, it's the YouTube manager thing. And it always starts off saying that the stream is too bad and then eventually it goes okay and then eventually it goes good. So we have to have this like 10 minute process where it feels like it's good enough for us to get online. And the problem is, is that as you know, or well, the reality is, not a problem, the reality is, is I'm absolutely slammed busy. Because I'm not a, this isn't my full time job. <laughs> so we actually just did some stuff for the uh, academy. Hello in Germany, hello in, and, and we went straight from the academy to this. Munich, anyway, let's see where everybody is. Covina, Australia, Germany, uh, North Carolina, Colorado, Florida, Hungary, Budapest, the Netherlands, beautiful, more Germanys, Oregon, Iowa, sunny Southampton, well that deserves a... That was, uh, that was definitely for Southampton. Hi from Bonnie, Scotland, Ottawa, Bolivia. Adelaide, Denmark, rather wonderful. I'm going to try and get uh, um, Eric to uh, get me a coffee here. So I still have, uh, from Tuesday, I still have that little uh, cold. So basically, uh, um, more Germany, wonderful Marcus, hello Marcus. Um, Italy, Toronto, still a little bit of a cold. Pick me, pick me, UK meep. <laughs> Stockholm, Seattle, hello Michigan, Ukraine, Macedonia. We had a winner in Macedonia. <laughs> We had a minnow in Montenegro. So what do I have quickly today? I have my Revstar. And for those that don't, you don't know, I'm a big fan of Yamaha. And basically, why am I a big fan of Yamaha? Because I'm sort of like, a, I practice what I preach. I'm always talking about finding amazing equipment which doesn't cost you an arm or a leg. And, uh... This is my favorite guitar I've ever owned. Um, it is a Japanese Rev Star, so it's made in Japan. It's not cheap, but it's not unbelievably expensive. It's like, you know, can see it's glued neck. It's a beautiful guitar, and it was $1,500. And so that's not cheap, don't get me wrong. Oh, it's also, see that nice curve there? But compared with buying the equivalent Les Paul, which would have been two or three times the price, this is as a... Uh, as my good friend uh, Phil Allen said, this is like playing the best Les Paul he'd ever played. So that's what I got. Anyway, let's talk about guitars. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk about guitars is it's sort of been, it's been the theme a little bit this week. We're talking about guitars. Um, I did read some of the comments yesterday. I didn't get to, um, yes, Santana used to play an SG2000. Um, I didn't get to play um, um, YouTube seems to be deleting posts for some reason we can still see your comments that's strange really okay that's very uh, I wonder why they're doing that I want, why is it what, what post is it deleting that's very strange very, very strange indeed. Are we getting some uh, some silliness? Anyway, um, shred it. Yes, I will shred it, but let's talk about guitars. So, it's interesting because 90% of the stuff that we do, um, you know, on here isn't really like super, super heavy, um, um, heavy rock guitars. Um, do I, yeah, I have, I have three Yamaha Pacificas. One over there, one down there, and one over here. Oh, there, sorry. You can't see it in the shot. There's a green one, a red one, and a um, sunburst one. So I have three of them. So yes, I do recommend it. Um, it is a, I'll, I'll tell you again, it's a Yamaha Revstar. It cost me $1,500 and it's made in Japan. So it's not the cheapest guitar I own, 
but it's as good as the best Les Paul I've ever played, and it's $1,500. It is super slinky. So you can whiz around. So you can whiz around on it like crazy. You can also... You also can blues it up. Bends really nicely. I would like to make a solo guitar album. We have talked about it, and we will, may well do it. So, so I am um, Matt Diamante said to us, "Let's do a giveaway right at the beginning, Matt." Do, 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 and I've got to get to his notes. Uh, did he tell me which one? He says, give away a prize at the very start. But he didn't actually say which one. So, you know, um, Matt, why don't you, you, you will swap. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to decide what to give away then. Um, I think we should give away the snake bite course with me and Ulrich. The reason why I think we should give away that course is because it gives you two completely different ways of mixing guitars. So from yesterday's video, a lot of people said, hey Warren, you and Bob, which was a completely different song, which is interesting, um, you know, EQ at different points, so I'm getting confused. Now, um, so um, the, the reality is, is why do we EQ at different points? Well, because they're different songs and different effects and different so they have different instruments that fit around stuff it's not always it's always a one size fits all there is no one size fits all approach so you have to go and and how were the guitars recorded so i recorded the guitars on one course and bob recorded them on another so he might be cutting and boosting frequencies to create a certain guitar sound around those drums. So I highly recommend that you, as far as rock ones are concerned, you check out mine and Ulrich's course, which is the snake bite one, which we're going to give away any second now. And Bob's course, Bob Marlette, who is actually coming over at 12, so he might walk in while we're here. Maybe I'll get him on camera for a minute. Check out Bob's resume. It's absolutely insane. Um... He worked with Black Sabbath. Uh, he did one of their albums. I think he did their big comeback record. He also did Tony Iommi solo. I believe he did two of their two of Tony's albums. He also did a Ozzy Osbourne solo record. He's also a virtuoso keyboard player. He he developed and produced Shine Down. So for rock, he also did the Airborne records for the Australians watching. I know there's a bunch of Australians, you know. Um, so he's really really amazing. The sweet spot on a speaker, that's a good segue. Uh, oh, you said that, unconfused me. Okay, yeah, Adam, see what I mean? It's like, it's a context of the song and how the guitars were recorded. So when you're watching those courses, what it's important for you to do is like, well, identify the similarities in what you're doing with what he's doing, you know what I mean? Or what I'm doing and what Oryx's doing. So we're gonna give away, first of all, before we, because Matt wants me to do it at the beginning. We're gonna give away one of the courses um, and the course we're going to give away is the Auric Warren course, my course with Auric. It's a Polish band called Snake Bite. It's big guitars. The drums I recorded at Hybrid, which is a wonderful studio in Santa Ana. Okay. Okay, how do I click on this? Michael B says, how hard do you push for matching guitar takes? Very, very hard. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a really, really, really good question. Um, basically, what... Um, if you're... Here's the reality between the difference in everything that we do between building things. If we build guitar parts, that's great. But... When you start getting into the bar by bar guitar that's copied and pasted, copied and pasted, and copied and pasted, that even though in small reality of listening to a four bar section, you're not going to notice. Over the whole song, I can guarantee you this, over the whole song, if you literally have copied and pasted all of the perfect parts and then found a perfect double of it, 
it's it just at the end of the song when you've done that with guitars you've done that with basses you've done that with drums it will sound um it will sound like a machine it will not sound real um it is really really unfortunate it's just one of those realities you you so to answer your question specifically michael basically what you should do is you should make you should work the musician hard if the part is like you know it's a heavy guitar part if it's like I'm doing little like well you need to make sure that that matches not like matches to look at matches sonically because that's the big big issue that we have with music is that people are looking at waveforms to make sure they match not everything sounds good when it matches that way but if you sit there and you punch in and get them to play over and over again just like they did when they were making the black album when they were making back in black when they were making these great rock albums that we all listen to when they did those albums they were literally going you know <laughs> And when they were coming to double it, they were sitting there and punching in, maybe even just, and then punch out, just, uh, they're like, it's too, it's too loose, you're behind the beat, punch in, no, nope, punch in, no, nope, punch in, yep, there it is, and they were doing that bar by bar, correcting stuff, so they would do full takes, the band would be in the room, you had, you know, the drummer, the bass player, you know, Malcolm and Angus, they'd be playing together with all the amps isolated on the headphones, and afterwards, they'd come back in and they'd listen and they'd fix things. They'd choose the drum take they liked. Maybe they would splice the tape from a, a verse from this or a chorus from that. But it was a lot more about musicians working off each other. My reality is, is I'm not a purist. Don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those people that's like, that's the only way to make music. Of course it isn't. When I'm on my own and I'm writing and recording, you know, even if it's just me and Eric, it's still me playing everything. And if I have to copy and paste something because I did it perfect here and I didn't don't like the way I did it there, fine. But when it's the only way you work, it starts to build up. It's about what I want to teach here is because I, I see so much reactionary comments from people and reactionary videos because they get more. You know, if I put a really reactionary clickbait title in my video, you know, I'll get more views. But the problem is, is that doesn't help people because when you've been doing music for a long time, like I have, like my whole life, I've learned that there is a hundred different ways to do any one thing. So there is no factual kind of way. There's no like absolute fact. So the, you can say, well, you know, okay, let's do it live and fix, or we can do it live and leave it sloppy, or we can do it, there's no one way of doing it, or you can cut and paste and move things around. But if you are cutting and pasting and move things around, remember it will lose some of that, you know, some of that realness and it will get boring. Yeah, Mutt Lang. So it's great. Um, yeah, again, and as I said, not much overdrive on that. Okay, so let's do our first giveaway. It's the Auric and Warren course, the Snake Bite course. And what about this? Well, playing guitar. Uh, Who's your favorite guitar player? Who is your favorite guitarist? Tell us who your favorite guitarist is, and we will do, we will give away, we will give away um, a course with Auric and myself, and you'll get to see how two different people um, will do, will do two, how two different people mix that same song. Okay, who is your favorite guitar? Ah, oh, Holdsworth. Holdsworth legato is so inspiring. You know where Holdsworth used to do that? Four note per string. So that's one octave for those guitar players. How beautiful is that? And then his whole, just that when he would do like those. Oh, 
Oh, I love Holdsworth's play. It was so inspirational. John Frusciante, amazing. Frank Zappa, amazing. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Anyway, Brian May, Eric Johnson, <laughs> that definitely was Jeff Beck. The Edge, amazing guitar player. Aldemiola, oh Aldemiola's, Aldemiola's like right hand is amazing. Dimebag, oh yeah, BB King, I love. See, I don't agree with that. Albert says, sorry, Albert, to pick, think about it. Nobody knows how addresses our EQ and processor pushed clean electric. It has a lot of dynamics and doesn't quite break up. It's either discorded guitars or natural compression or acoustic. Well, see, this is where I started off talking about. You've obviously not really seen any of our videos. I've got 530 videos, and I've only got like a three or four on heavy guitars. Most of my videos don't use heavy guitars. I even have a guitar recording video teaching you how... I have my guitar set on my amp set slightly to overdrive at all times. So actually it's kind of the reverse. I've done very, very few heavy guitar ones, but I've done tons of videos on the other way around. So I, I, you probably haven't watched many of my videos, Albert. So basically what I do is I'll set an amp. And let me turn it up a little bit. And this is not even a tube amp. This is a little G deck amp that happens to be in here. It's not my tube amp, it's not my Marshall, but I'll set the amp so basically you've got sort of this level. So you've got like a... So when you're playing soft... You can have that... you have it around the area and then whack it up basically for me it's like get your amp to have some crunch and just make it so um, just so that when you're playing like with feel and you're allowing yourself um, you know So it's really just about digging in. It's that kind of feel. Yeah, Dave Gilmore's amazing. I mean, Come To Me Numb is still one of the greatest guitar solos ever. Between that and the Bohemian Rhapsody guitar solo. Oh, and I think another favorite for mine, Cosa Venus Lovers, which I already played, is... That. What, what am I talking about? They're wrong. I think also Joe Walsh, and uh, it, that's a, a really wonderful one to listen to, is to uh, Hotel California as well. Tony Iommi is one of my favorites. Congratulations to Vinette, you just won a free course. Oh, and a 6050 Ultimate Channel Strat from Matt DSP. Thank you, Matt DSP, for give, helping us out there. Look at that. Peter Green was phenomenal. At the moment, I'm just plugged into only a G deck. Um, what was your choice, by the way? What was your choice, uh, Vinit? What was your choice on it? Thank you, chat. Martin Offner, fantastic. Yeah, the 650 is amazing. Yeah, thank you, Mag DSP, for doing that. I appreciate it. Do I use reverb and delay on heavy sound? So this is a good one. Okay, so quite often... Um, oh, I love Tony Iommi. Uh, so is Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, absolute masterpiece. Now, um, at the moment, this is kind of a lead tone that I've got set up. So it's just, it's, so it's got... It's got those delays you hear. So 
that kind of leave tone that I have at the moment has those delays on it. On a rhythm part, I might do delays. Why would I do delays? Well, I would do it if I was doing like rake parts, like. <laughs> On this kind of part, so on this kind of part when you want like a big massive tone. So when you're doing that and you want those kind of, um, thank you Elpo, uh, so when you want those kind of big rhythm like rake guitars, a little delay is nice. Now why is that? Well it's because of this. If, if I don't have delay I could be like, you got that period where you're moving from one to another so you want you want that kind of now with open chords you're going to get sustain so that, those little delays there help blend and they allow it so that when one chord is raking into another the delay carries on and just gives you the ability to move your hands without it going crunk 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 it goes like rah, rah, rah. so I do use delay now. however on a part maybe like Too bad there so that was like a little bad version of Iron Maiden there but I think with a little um, a little tiny bit of that delay stuff it's fine you know what I mean but with a louder delay than what we've got here I mean here's it's pretty slight yeah it's pretty slight but if you want the big powerful rakes to hold on and you want those massive rah, rah, kind of guitars you could probably eke up the delay a little bit more than I've got going on there delay is is, a, is can be your friends um, so who deleted Phantom of the Opera it says message deleted by produce like a pro is it is this is this is there some YouTube dyna dynamic thing going on <laughs> It might be there might be some weird random YouTube's doing it for us, but it says it was deleted by us. Did you just delete that? No, I'm off the Wi-Fi. Yeah, so it's not us doing it. So I don't know if you know because there's nothing wrong with saying Phantom of the Opera because that is what that is there. So what am I using? Actually, it's just what I just picked up. It's a super heavy Tortex. I personally, when it comes to lead playing, like the heavy picks. You know. <laughs> And the reason why I like the heavy picks when you're going to be doing heavy guitars, um, at least leads and stuff, is that I don't have to copyright, maybe Justin, I don't have to play that hard, do I? So I can do. To get that. To get all that kind of fast speed, um, I didn't get the old text. Thank you for remembering me. I have re reminded me. I have to get that. So, lots of things to talk about. Lots of great questions. Um, you know, YouTube told me to use the uh, what do you call that thing? Where like if you, it, it, you you can pay and get like a question above the others. Phantom of the YouTube deleted it. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to ask me, I'm going. Otherwise, I'm just going to cherry pick because there's so many great questions. Okay, can you tell difference with dynamic EQ and multiband EQ and what makes multiband EQ and compression stuff? Uh, by the way, thanks for everything. I mean, to be honest, the differences are pretty negligible. But the thing about a dynamic EQ is it's like you can, you can definitely get there and pinpoint things. Um, multibands tend to be something I quickly open, generically use, and do like big frequency areas. So I'll maybe take a wide, you know, lows, mid range, high mids. And above and just like compress them and even them out um, but good on guitars somewhat I tend to use a multi-band 
essentially for low end on, on instruments to try and even out the low end. Um, and then dynamic EQs, people reach for them all the time, specifically to remove like maybe a frequency, you know, like it's more targeted and you can just get in there and like take out like a specific frequency. So yeah, with the dynamic EQ, I would always, I'd be using that really for a horrible nasal tone or a high frequency squeak kind of coming in occasionally. A multiband I use generically to control large sections like mids, low end, high mids, and etc. Are there outboard multibands? Yes, there are some outboard multi ones, yeah. Oh, I see. Because somebody said Big Muff, the message got retracted by YouTube. That's pretty funny. I do, um, uh, I do use Big Muff pedals, and um, actually, can you grab my little Big Muff? One of my favorite pedals is a little Big Muff from the 70s. This one here. This gets used a lot. You guys know this? And this is an old one. I've had it for a long time. I personally had it for 20, 25 years, and uh, it was old when I got it. Um, that's a good pedal, and what I like about it is it has two, has a, two different settings and a volume. <laughs> And it's dumb. And sometimes, uh, you know, as Mac DSP, uh, active EQs are hot, good for honks and overtones. I agree entirely. So, <coughs> so with heavy guitars like that, I think with the big muff, I use it more for specialty stuff. Maybe for single lines. You know, maybe like a. A line like that on a big muff would be like, you know, that that kind of stuff. You know, um, something something that has like just a bit of a fuzz to it. You know, you can use it inside of guitar sounds, and I've heard a lot of grunge period stuff had that. Um, tends to lose a bit of the definition if you're trying to get like a, you know. like the difference you know getting some of the you know trying to get some like like little subtle bits and pieces the big muff is probably just gonna like override over it and just be like here's the guitar sound I know if you download the love me I'm rich well Academy members already get this because it's a free course in uh, in um, it's a free course inside of the academy, but that guitar sound was uh, a pair of guitars through a big muff. But it's like you know the the guitars are like you know they're just this big wall of noise and ugliness, which a big muff does really really well. So it's that kind of stuff, you know. Um, so here's a good question. Do you mix single coils and humbuckers to make a massive wall? Um, yes and no. I mean, yes, single coil pickups can definitely give you a bit more bite. Um, I tend to find that um, I want to use different voicings together. One thing, there's a couple of things I don't do. Um, I don't really fatten single coils in the mix. I'm going to use a single coil. Like we recently, when I was mixing Ace Freely's album, um, Ace did um, Strat guitars, but mainly Les Pauls. And when he does Strats, he does them for these kind of parts. So what he'll do is he'll take the high voicing. So he might have like, you know. And he'll do. So he'll actually use the guitar that best serves the part. I think it's one one of the one of the things that um, what one of the things. Thank you, Ken. I'm glad you enjoy the uh, academy. Um, yeah, it's. I'm not sure. It does say Mick. I can see your comment. I think when somebody said um, S C R E W, I can't say it. Um, uh, I don't use that plugin, Scott, myself. Um, for those of you that want to know quickly about what mastering plugin I like, I really like the T Rex. I've used it since it came out. It's one of my favorite ones. I use it almost every day. It's a great, great plugin. T Rex, highly recommend it. 
Um, I just do, you know, and I love Mac DSP, don't get me wrong, but I have to be honest, you know, um, and they make amazing plugins too, great multibands, great EQs, but the T-Rex has been a, a go-to for mine for a long time. Um, so getting back to the point, yeah, so it's about voicing. So if I was going to do like a stratty kind of guitar part, I would choose the guitar for the voicing and the voicing for the, 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 the uh, you know, the voicing and the guitar makes sense. Then quite often, you know, what um, one of the tricks is to use either a baritone. If you don't have a baritone, will you hand me the uh, jazz bass, please? You don't have a baritone, another way to get really massive guitars is to play is to play the same part on the bass. Now, it's not as obvious as you think. I don't mean play, you know, like don't just mirror it with the low notes, but play it on the D string. Now that might sound really obvious to you, but listen to this. So this is this is just these two pickups going for a little tiny amp, playing a D, the D, G, and C part on a D string. So that, as you probably guessed, is in the same, sorry for the buzzes, as you probably guessed is in the same register, obviously, as this. So what do we have? We have a guitar going around with this. The D string on the bass. Did you hear how solid it sounds? It doesn't go. It doesn't go. It doesn't have a floppy. It goes. It's like super, super solid. So that's a really big tip for mine. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it in a video for you next week. I probably should have put it in a video this week. But it's a great way to get solid sounding guitar oomph, and you blend that into your guitars. So if somebody doesn't get to this first and do, do the tip before me, I'll make sure that you get it next week. Um, <laughs> we'll have the, Monday will be our five guitar recording trips and we'll put that in. All right, Alex Waters says, what are your thoughts on using a cheap mixer to sum two mics on the guitar, Auric Wilds technique or the Friedman technique 257s? at 45 degrees. I absolutely love it. Um, now you've obviously, Alex, seen that with, uh, with Glenn. <coughs> now, just so you know, Glenn flew down to see us and go to that session that I did with Auric because we're doing some very special things um, between um, Alex over at Gear Gods and Glenn over at Spectra and myself have been doing some really great stuff with Auric and Cameron and of course our good friend Bob Marlette. So we went to go and see Auric. So I was there and we'd already talked about that technique, the Friedman technique and using the small cheap mixer to sum. We'd already talked about that um, when um, in a previous video with Auric. So I was there when Auric actually was showing Glenn the technique and Glenn of course put out that really great video about it. What are my thoughts on it? Glenn did it here for us. Did that go up in the Academy? It was an Academy video. Yeah. So it was an Academy video. So if you're an Academy member, you can see Glenn doing the full technique there. All I can say is it sounds amazing. It sounds really, really good. And it can be just a pair of 57s and the cheapest little crappiest Mackie or Behringer mixer. What do we do it with? We have a Behringer or a Mackie? We have this super cheap, like four input one. And it sounds, it was a Mackie. What is good about it is it cancels out some of the ugly mud. I think it's just, what happens, you've got 157 that way, you've got another one like this at a 45 degree angle, and they hear the sound ever so slightly out of phase in the low mids. Um, good question, Alex. But So it cancels out some of this, that sucks, in rock guitars, and I'm not talking about like, this kind of rock, but this kind of rock. In that kind of rock, 
it's fantastic because it gets rid of some of the ugliness that you don't want in there, but gives, keeps some of the low lows and keeps some of the high highs and just gives you a really, really massive guitar track. So I think it's a definitely an amazing thing to have in your arsenal. Really, really good. So fantastic question there. I really appreciate it, Alex. So yes, I do love it. I think it's really, really good. I wouldn't be using it on my regular kind of, you know, most of my guitars, as I was talking about earlier, because somebody was saying, you only ever, only ever talk about heavy guitars, which of course, you know, it's funny, as you know, those who follow me, is that I don't usually talk that much about heavy guitars, hence why we're doing a heavy guitar week. If I'm doing a guitar part like this, I'm not gonna be using the Freeman technique. I'm just going to be taking the 57 and moving it from the cone where it's super bright to the edge where it's dark and finding where I like it and Bob's your uncle. Now bear in mind most of the time I have it about halfway, a little bit of both. Um, when I'm double miking, I'll put a 57 facing the cone. So here's the cone like this. I'll put a mic so it goes at an angle to it and then the one that's double mic'd comes in underneath at the same angle. Does that make sense? So you've got one like this and one like that so like this opposite each other does that make sense so think about it cone is like this microphone points at the direction of the cone that was something dave jordan who did all of the all of the um jane's addiction and most importantly for those of you that are big rock fans he did all of the allison chain stuff that's what he would do um wonderful why the mix are not a separate track well the thing is is you're you yeah, somebody wrote, Fanny's your aunt, the message is retracted. Hey, uh, Matt, if you're setting the uh, YouTube swear words, I think there's a couple we can let through. I think Fanny, Fanny's your aunt's okay. Mike in the back of the speaker, yes. So what we'll do... Alex is um, well, often, um, this is not for the Friedman technique though, not for that what you were asking about this. This is just for the Dave Jordan technique. So what he did is he'd always take small cabs. Yeah, I can't believe that was retracted. Um, so uh, do I pan the room mic? Yes. So quite often I'll do that. If I've got a guitar on one side, I'll pan the room mic on the other. Guitar on the other side, pan the room mic on there. It gives you a lot more width. It makes the guitar feel far more separated and larger. Um, if I've only got a mono guitar, then of course I won't do that. Um, uh, SSL to mix, uh, mix and sum your guitar. Yeah, I've done that. Um, I think part of the thing that people like, part of the people that like um, with using the Behringer and the Mackie mixers to do that, is the sort of sterility of them. Is the fact that they have no real voicing that they're giving to them and also probably they don't have the headroom so they might actually be um they might actually be a combination of um you know some of the electronics crapping out a little bit a little extra harmonics because they're being hit a little too hard you know and also the ease now remember this came from Auric's experience of working with static x when he was given these guitars that they had done and they were massive and he was like how did you do this and the guy comes in with this little Mackie mixer and a pair of 57s and said this is how I recorded it so I think it's pretty remarkable to think about that in those terms you know um, have you ever used a guitar tape deck to improve your guitar sound yeah absolutely I've bounced stuff to tape um, what spots of the speaker do you usually mic edge or cone um, I thought I just explained it but I'll explain it again it, it depends I will move it around. Obviously, it's going to be brighter on the in the cone and darker on the edge. Uh, so I think it's a combination of yes. There's a t Tim. There's a just here. Theory of mixing. The theory of mixing. That's a big one. That's a big one. Message deleted because I want to win that one. I'm not sure what's going on with all these deletions. Anyway, 
Let's do another competition. Let's do another giveaway. I can't give away this guitar. This is hard earned cash bought this guitar. So, um, anyway, so um, we've done favorite guitar. What it, uh, we've done favorite guitar player. And that was absolutely wonderful to hear. What is your favorite guitar amp? What is the amp for you that you've recorded? And even simulation or emulation if you've never used a real app what is the one that you feel you can get the most out of you know so is it okay what i mean is like is there a combo or an amp head either a real one or an emulation for those of you who have never recorded real ones that you go to and you go oh this can be rock this can be metal this could be clean is there something that does that interesting jcm 800 or jc uh, jc 120 Bogner's JCM 900. I'm a fan of a JCM 900. Use one myself. Let's show what happened with the AC. Hey, the AC just came on. It's getting warm in here. Okay, Fender Twin, Fender Hot Rod, Black Stars, AC 30s, good choices. Um, Soldano's. Oh, yeah, 78. There you go, 78 Marshall. I have one myself. Two Mesa Boogie or PV 5150s, great amplifiers, JCM 900s. I'm glad to see a lot of JCM 900s because for those of you that know me, know that I use a 900 and a JMP, a 78 JMP. So I have a combination. Those are my main two amps. Trainers, great Canadian amps. JTM 45, I used to have one. I sold it. Biggest mistake. Huge mistake. Um, JMPs, JCM 2000s. Um, Orange, Yamaha, THR 100s, yes, we love that too. Mustang Amp, Orange, Princeton's, Plexi Head, yeah, of course. Fender Deluxe with Tube Screamer, great. Yeah, lots of people, uh, Adam hate 900s, but you know what? That's kind of the popular, that's the popular thing from when they came out, is everybody hated them. And then everybody secretly admitted that all the records that they, they recorded were with 900s. Uh, JCM message retracted. Not sure why. That's actually no. If it's retracted, it means you took them back. Uh, crappy Fender Solid State actually rocks. I believe it, Alex. I believe it. Laney Cub. Well, I love Laney. Laney are a wonderful company. You know, I'm a huge Black Sabbath Tony Iommi fan, and he uses Laney, and he's always had the best guitar tones. So always. Uh, Jared Keller. Woohoo! Jared Keller. So can we like and share? It's, can we like and share um, the, um, hey, Eric, do you have Bob's information? I believe I have his number. Could you give me a, give him a call? He's calling me and let him know where we are. I'm actually texting him the address of where we're at. But can you give him a call, make sure he's got it. And let him know to come down the driveway. Um, so I don't know if he's going to be, maybe, hopefully he'll, uh, he'll walk in while we're still here. We can ask him some questions. Yeah, Joe Brucey has a sticker sash of Laney's, and yeah, he and I talked about that. Actually, one of, um, one of the big things that, um, and this is a big shout out, because I've seen some 5150s. Those of you that are in the know, know that the 5150, the PV one is the one. And those are quite affordable. I don't have one. And Glenn and lots of other people and lots of you have already mentioned the 5150. That PV one is really, really good. Really, really, really good. Um, the Yeah, the 2000s are good. I still think the 900 and the JMP is my favorite. 800s have a sound. What's interesting is during the 80s when the 800 was brand new, all the guitar players were using JMPs. So people make that common misconception that guitarists were using 800s in the 80s. They weren't. It was only it, it, it was only the rock guitar players were all using JMPs and sound sim and uh, 70s amps in the 80s. You know, it was the 90s that people started looking back to 800s. That's when the tones got a little fizzier. You know, there was something about an 800 that didn't quite have that girth that we loved of the JMPs. However, you know, all of these amps have value, and if we're in a situation where we have a lot of these amps. To, to, to use. Want to go get the guys? Uh, like in five minutes. Just in case. Um, yeah, Kempers are great. We have a whole series of Kemper profiles coming out. Um, <coughs> yeah, 800s do found skizzy, uh, fizzy and scooped. Yep, definitely. Um, Fender Supersonic. 
Um, so I will say, let's do one more giveaway. Moonchild hates marshals. I mean, you obviously, you obviously haven't had the chance to use the right marshals, because when you get to use the right marshal, um, it's going to change your mind, which is a re which is a reason why 50% of all the amps that have been mentioned here are marshals. And but gun to my head, Laney's my favorite amp. AC30 is one of my favorite amps. I would say recording wise in the studio, the most common amp, small amp that I have seen anybody ever record with that is a professional musician, like especially session players, they will always have one in their arsenal is a Deluxe 65, a Fender Deluxe 65. If you're gonna have one amp and that you turn up in a studio, a Deluxe 65 is the way to go. Yeah, PV, PV really are um, one of the most underrated amps in the world. I really, really, really wanna interview Hartley PV. If anybody watching happens to be a friend or know Hartley, I really want to interview him. We use PV basses. I grew up on Kiwi guitars. I grew up on Yamaha guitars. I This to me is like, you know, I grew up, my father was a painter and a sculptor, for those of you who know, and he, he we didn't have any money, you know what I mean? I grew up with a great arts background, background and very well educated because we lived in a great area and great parents. Um, you've got a deluxe. But the reality is we didn't have any money to buy anything, so I built my first guitar with my dad, just like Brian May did, because I wanted to be Brian May, of course. And the gear I had was PV amps, Classic 65 with an STX in it, um, you know, the saturation and everything, and that's that's what I had, and that was my main gigging amp. I love that amp. To this day, I still love it. And the reason why I mentioned that when it started off was because of the Joe Barisi comment about Laney's. Now, Joe has walls of PV amplifiers, you know, uh, best, what's the reason for recording small amps is that they're already EQ'd. One of the problems with the big amps is they can have unbelievably uncontrollable low end. So when you've got this low end which is just flopping all over the place, you end up like having to mix that low end and if you're just only high passing it, it can get, it's not quite so controlled and tight sounding. Now when you have tight low end from a smaller speaker, like an eight or a 10 inch speaker from like a champ or whatever, you can actually add low end back onto it and it's very, very controlled. Because here's the low end and the high end that's sort of like already scooped a bit. Add the lows to it, it just gives it a nice like kind of, you know what I mean? So there's a good reason for using small caps. A very good reason. As you guys know, I use um, the Tone Tubby caps, which are the hemp speakers, which um, I have... <coughs> yeah, Joe has, does have a candy lamp for guitar player. Uh, the Tone Tubby Cab, which, you know, Slash has replaced his Marshalls with. He puts the, the, they're in. The reason why a lot of us like it is because the thing about Marshalls is they can have a little bit of a high screaming high end. So the hemp speaker that is in the Tone Tubby Cabs controls that high end for me beautifully. So I can still boost the presence on a Marshall, which is where all of the sweet distortion starts happening, but I don't get that extra excessive bzzz that hits my ears too much, you know? All right, so last giveaway. Last but no means least, you'll get to win a 6050 Mac DSP, and of course, plug-in, and of course, you get to win the Snakebite um, uh, video. Now, now, the thing about this video and this course is it's me, I recorded the drums at Hybrid Studios, and, the, and then the mixing, we did two mixes, me mixing it in a hybrid fashion using Pro Tools, plugins, and a console. <coughs> <coughs> My hair is looking marvelously messy today. Thank you. And Auric Wild mixing entirely in the box using Logic. So you're gonna get to see a mix done in Pro Tools, hybrid, and entirely in a box using Logic. <coughs> <clears throat> two totally different ways of doing it. So it's a really, really good course. Plus, you get, courtesy of Mac DSP, a free 6050. So you're going to get also a free plugin as well. So, drum roll. We've done favorite amp. We've done favorite guitar player. All right, what is your favorite guitar? What is your utilitarian guitar that you think will do absolutely everything? What is the guitar? That um, this to me is the guitar. Like if I change the guitar amp sound, for instance, and it's just a Fender G deck I'm using, but if I go to something a little less dis less distorted, what do we have here? This sound. Here it goes like a mid rangey kind of rockabilly. <laughs> So 
So what am I saying? Well, the thing about this guitar that I love is I can now make it thinner. I can... I go to the two pickups together with a thinner sound. I can go humbucker on here. down a little bit and I've got jazz. A little less. So this is why I love the rev star. This guitar is, so for me, that's my guitar. Now, I don't have a Brian May guitar. If I had a Red Special, I'd probably be telling you that the Red Special is the greatest guitar. Huge Brian May fan. Hey, Adam, congratulations. You won a free course and a 6050 Ultimate channel strip from Mac DSP. That's great. Yeah, so that's a full channel strip. You've got compression, you've got EQ, you've got everything built into it. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, the Duesenbergs are amazing. Really, really great. Yeah, the best guitar is the one in your hands. I agree. Gibson Les Paul Classic 69, SG Standards. Tellys are fantastic as well. Absolutely wonderful. How does one win? You literally just, uh, we ask a question and you answer it and then Matt picks it at random. That's it. You just have to participate to win. Just have to participate. The homemade guitar is missing. And it's an old friend of mine who has it and I don't know. Tom, you just have to keep doing it. The thing is, how many people do we have online at the moment? And by the way, please like and share. Um, how many people do we have online? I'm going to check now because I'm not looking at the YouTube channel. We have 319 people watching. Thank you ever so much. Please like and share. We have 173 likes. If you could hit that like button, that would be absolutely amazing. <coughs> the T60 is an amazing guitar. I use a T40. Yeah, we do giveaways on every live stream. Every live stream we do, we do three giveaways. Have I met Brian May in person? No, I haven't. You have no idea how much I want to meet him. That would be amazing. Uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, 318. Yeah, people, 19 people. Um, can we get the likes up? Can you like and can you share it? The re reason why I asked for that is because basically it lets people know that we're online. <laughs> the the usual trolls. Oh, they come afterwards. They come afterwards from other... Um, they're, they're always the same people and we can we pinpoint where they are it's it is, it's fine talk eyes are amazing you know that's the price of what we do you know we're giving out a lot of free information and we also do it not only do we get a lot of free information we give it from a, a, a place of you know actual daily use because we're not professional tutors you know um, so what tends to happen is like you know the guys that are, are trying to do this but maybe aren't professionals and stuff like that you know, I don't know. It's it's a it's a weird place. So I don't mind. It's okay. The dislikes mean that we're doing something right. Doesn't that you know what I mean? If you're doing something right and you're and you're giving away a lot of free information and helping people, you'll always get dislikes from people who don't like that, who don't like the free information, who don't like you know um, educated kind of discussion, and also don't like the fact that we have this amazing community. This is um, this is why do I do produce like a pro? I do it because. I love this. I was talking to YouTube yesterday and they said there's two distinct people that do this. There's people, and he was very complimentary, the person over there. He's like, there's people, guys like you who are so passionate about this that you want to give back and help people. And he goes, and then there's the people that just figure out how to do it as a business and have like super slick kind of videos and stuff like that. And he said they're very easy to see the differences. I think for me, it's like I initially started this because I wanted to be able to to connect all the worlds together. I think we had Graham, who's amazing, Graham Cochran, at bringing people into the industry. When he did those videos on how to make music with $300 or less, that was amazing. And then we have Dave Pensado, who, you know, has been going now for like seven years, and he's got this, you know, um, very, very, um, 
you know, talking to like big professional mixers and producers and stuff. And all I wanted to do was be in the middle and was just connect everybody together, not be just talking to big famous people and not be just trying to help the beginner, but help everybody and connect us all together. Um, you know, that's what it is. It's like, for me, it's like, I just want to connect everybody together and not like do this us as them. I don't, you know, I don't like those videos um, where they're like, you know, don't high pass or you're high passing too much and all this kind of stuff. It's like, um, and, and there was another one about subtractive, subtractive EQ and boosting EQ and, and, and just misinformation because it's not, um, they haven't been in the industry and watch it evolve. So I think I also am blessed that I started um, at 16 professionally, you know, yeah, haters are going to hate. I started at 16, so I've seen tape go to digital and go to where we are and I've made you know I was a DJ in the late 80s and early 90s so I've DJed and done EDM and I also played rock music and I had five record deals and I've sold albums and I've done A&R for labels so for me it's like it's bring this all together all of this knowledge and bring the whole thing together and then I manage a band the Matthews that you all helped you helped them do you know how much you helped them because you downloaded their tracks and you mixed them um, you know, you did all of this incredible stuff to help people, help them, and they signed a major label record deal, and now they're coming in. I picked them up from the airport last night because you as a community help promote them. That is the power of the internet, it's the power of YouTube, it's the power of what we do. And I produced that band and I, with Bob, and I also managed them. So this is like, um, you know, really, really good. There's no luck involved in it, my friend. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work, you know. It's really about helping people and, you know, making it so that um, we all work hard and we help each other. This is all about a community. I hope, I hope that some of you, you know, Academy members and stuff like this, I hope that you build incredible careers. And lots of people are doing really, really good. Yes, I'm going to do the PSR, PRS plug-in next week. <coughs> I, I, you know, I was one of the first people to see it. Do you remember when I was at uh, NAMM this year? I demoed it. I loved it. Oh, it's okay, HK. Pe people hate it just because there's a sense of competitiveness, you know what I mean? And it's difficult because we offer so much to so many people. Because, you know, you've watched us like, take artists and grow and get them signed. And people are becoming successful around us. And we, you help all, you see all of that happening. And you see this great community. And, you know, some people maybe are envious of it. But that's okay. That means we're doing something okay. And you know, you guys absolutely rock. You are, and girls, a lot of girls here. So thank you ever so much, ever so much. Uh, yeah, it looks like YouTube is, if you use, yeah, I am sick, yeah. I've got a lung infection, I'm, uh, um, yes, exactly, just keep it positive. How do you join? Well, you go to producelikeapro.com. You can do a monthly at $17, which is going to go up soon to $27. So those of you that signed up for $17, you can stay in at $17. You can join for one year for $169. And we do new tracks every month, and I mix, critique them. Um, and we do Q&As with people, and we have free lessons in there. And we have about 30 multi-tracks which have Vinnie Carluta playing drums on some of them. Some of them have Sean Hurley playing bass, John, John Button, uh, me, Tim Pierce, some of the best musicians in the world. And you can use those multi-tracks, you know, to build your resume. Pretty amazing. All right, thank you ever so much. Where's Bob? I thought Bob was going to come. Can you please like and share before we go off? I'll stay a little longer if I can get some more likes and shares. I got 242. And I got 318. So if you haven't already liked and shared, please do that. And maybe I'll stay a little bit longer. Maybe we'll catch the Marlette, Roberto. You're going to have to take the boys anyway to go and do their um, SIM cards and all that stuff. Yeah. Have they have they managed to contact you yet? No. They probably don't have Wi-Fi still. So. Okay. Go pick them up. Cool. Uh, Bob is slow. I was hoping he's going to be here. He called, he was 15 minutes away, so... He was 15 minutes away? I'll just keep waffling on then, and see if we can get him. I'll give you updates on the guys. <laughs> He's knocking on the door. Uh, okay, can you recommend jobs in music other than a producer or performer? Yes. It's a good question. Alex, are you a member of the Academy, first of all? Because uh, we're, um, we're talking about doing um, some of those discussions, like one of this discussion, private for the Academy. 
So I'll go live. I'll go live, and we'll just do business discussions. Yeah, I've met Pete Fauna many times. I've jammed with him, played with him years ago. Yeah, he's a great guy. So yeah, Alex, that's a great question. Um, hmm. I would say, I would say, do a bit of everything and see where you get pulled towards. Do you know what I mean, Alex? Well, I, I, I have to know a little bit more. Are you a member of the academy? If you're a member of the academy, we can we can get a little bit more uh, one on one and talks about some of this stuff in even greater detail. But essentially, what I would highly recommend is that you know you have your own YouTube channel. And if you have a YouTube channel and you're a member of the Academy, we're going to promote each other. We're going to push each other. So that's really, really important. So if you have your own YouTube channel, you can, you can do a little bit, um, a little bit of what we do. You can do some teaching stuff. Um, okay, I think you should join Alex because you'll get a lot more uh, support from. You know, you can do mixes and productions and stuff, and people will critique it and help you. There's zero, zero ego inside of it. But anyway, so I would highly suggest you join. And if you join now, it's still only $17 a month, but it's going to go up to 27 soon. Um, so, um, so basically, um, what I would suggest is you do a bit of everything. You do, you write songs, you record songs, you play stuff. You know, you you get a lot of things happening. You make sure you have a good social media presence. And if you're a good guitar player, you know, if I was living. Hmm, if I was living in like Minnesota and I was a great guitar player, I would probably teach guitar as well as teach recording. Now, what happens is guys that teach or girls that teach guitar, for instance, or, you know, good young guitar players come to them, young singers come to them to learn. And before you know it, they're recording them. It becomes it, it's a business. You, what you are is like if you own recording equipment and you're a musician, you can teach, teach what you play. You can create your own business model by having people that come to you wanting to learn how to record wanting to learn you know to take their demos and stuff it's um it's that kind of thing you know what i mean it's really just a case of you need to sort of like find your way um you're in minnesota there you go but i think yeah, mix, mixing is stressful so i think for you alex i would say that's what i would do is i would I would hone your skills and throw up a wide net of things. Throw out a wide net to see whether, you know, what you catch. Because if you're teaching people, you're also, you know, doing, um, you know, you're doing multiple things. You'll find that you will end up getting that business model pretty it will start to define itself. And as you start getting opportunities in different areas, that's when you can start asking specific questions. And I can give you advice on, you know, film and TV music licensing things and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Because, you know, you, as you know, I've had success in trailers and in Glorious Bastards. You know, I, I did the trailer for that. There was a couple of different ones, but I did one of those and it was very well paid. There's trailer stuff. There's about half a dozen trailers I've had. I've got film, I've got music in TV shows. I've also produced bands and engineered bands that have been on Grey's Anatomy. You know, um, if you've got, have you guys downloaded the, um, the um, you've got the Mark Needham course? Because that song was in an episode of Grey's Anatomy, played for like a minute and a half. It was a big deal. You know, that made a lot of money. That was like a $70,000 placement, you know? And that's a song I produced and played on and engineered and mixed. And uh, Mark mixed a version of it as well. Um, that was used, Mark Needham, so you can see that course. The point is, is like, that's our industry. There's a lot to it. As you know, I'm involved with gear manufacturing. I'm involved with all kinds of different stuff. So for me, that's where it's at. If you want all of my guys that work for me, like Eric and now Andrew is starting full time, um, I want them all and everybody in the academy to be mini me's, to be guys that, you know, I can help develop to be you know, uh, an entrepreneurial mind. So that's why it's a good idea to be in the academy. That's why it's a good idea to be part of this community. Because, you know, there's a lot of professional YouTube teachers out, but they're not actually making money in the music industry. They're making money from selling you courses. What the what makes us specialists produce like a pro is like 90% of my income comes from making the music. All of the instruments and the equipment that you see in this room 
is all generated from making music. And now it is my job to give back to you and to get you in a position where you can be me. You know, it's not, that's what is my job. I've only made money. If you go to, um, yeah, I know the original mini me, that's very sad. Uh, what I suggest you do is go go to, I don't know if you can do it from here. See, here's allmusic.com. Go check out the stuff I've, I've worked on. I don't know if you can click on it, but go on there. Go and check out what I've done. Now, there's, don't get me wrong, there's things missing from there. That's like in 2017, they didn't put anything up, any of the f five or six albums I did that year. But go there and go there and check out the sort of things that I've done. You can also go to my website, which is horrifically out of date, warrenhewitt.com. Um, and just see that, you know, the thing is, is I'm working every day. So why I have YouTube, why we do the Facebook stuff, why we do all of these things is to basically show you this is what it's like to be a young entrepreneur and make money. Now, I'm getting older, don't get me wrong, but I'm still relatively young compared with, with some of the people here. So it's it's that what I'm trying to do is show you here it is. I live in the hills in Laurel Canyon in a beautiful area in Los Angeles and I grew up five of us in a two-bedroom house that was 654 square foot uh, a semi-detached bungalow and how do you get from semi-detached bungalow with a father who's a painter and a sculptor who barely makes ends meet but is a loving father and a massive talent and a be beautiful human being how do you get from that to living in the hills in Los Angeles. You do it from a lot of work. A lot of work. Um, the monthly sign up, can we, Matt? Uh, well, if you sign up for the email list, you, you, yeah. I mean, there's a yearly as well. We are gonna be putting up the monthly. Hey, Matt, if you're watching, can you send them, can you give them a direct monthly? And work your ass off, yeah. Work your butt off. That's the reality, but that's what I wanna show you. A bungalow is a, a, a one, one, one level house. And ours was semi-detached. It means that we had these two 600 square foot little tiny things stuck together, like little track houses have in America. But it was 654 square foot. Um, and uh, it, it, it's like two bedrooms. It's two, two bedrooms. There was one main bedroom for my parents, and then there was one main bedroom for me and my brother. And then my sister slept in what we call a box room, which is basically a closet. You know, yeah. Um, okay, so Matt's put, um, done the sign up there, and if they want to do the monthly, it's seventeen dollars currently, but it's going to go up to twenty-seven. Uh, um, yeah, Adam, you're 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 kind of you're on the fence of never being on the channel again. I, I know you're trying to be funny, but um, I know you're trying to be funny, but. Um, you know, this is, that's what I mean. It's just like we're, to, we're trying to help each other, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it's, I grew up, <coughs> I grew up in a, in a kind of a, a place where, to me, I love this. Um, thanks, me. That's great. And a prefab, yeah. Post-war prefab house. Yep, I know those. It's like, this is, this is a really, really, um, this is a really great opportunity to have a community that helps each other. It's very, very positive. This is an incredibly positive place. And I really want to help people here because I made the money that I make from doing this. You know, this is what I do. Um, so they want to know with the monthly, if you can send them to the monthly as well. So basically this, you know, this came, all of this came Tottenham, beautiful. Sorry, I'm a Chelsea fan, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, so basically, <coughs> all of we have, what we have here, come came from making music. You know, so it's really important. When I moved over to doing more social media stuff and doing building that community uh, academy to help foster our community, it was purely and simply to help each other. So I don't know where Bob is. Um, I don't know where our surprise guest might be. Michael, I love, I love California. There's nothing wrong with California. Well, exactly. It's not even about, um, hello, Plug in Alliance. Hello. Hello, how are you? We have been uh, emailing in the past. We should, send me an email. Hope you're doing marvelous well. Mac DSP's on as well. I, this is great though. And this is what's absolutely wonderful. Um, 
This is what's so fantastic, Justin. This is what's so wonderful because this is the Produce Like a Pro community. Have you? Did you guys notice? I was looking yesterday. Um, I was looking yesterday and I noticed something. Let's have a check. I'm going to my channel. Did you see this? Hey! You see this? We have 196,000 subscribers nearly. I'm on live. Woo! You gotta love it. You gotta love it. You wanna come on? Sure, I'll go on with you. You're looking very, very svelte. Look at you. Very sophisticated. That's why chicks dig me. <laughs> How are you, my friend? Hello, people. Oh, my hand. Oh, yeah. Look, it's Mr. Bob Marlette Hello. with cigar. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, I think if you if you think you sit on the couch, I think you'll be in the shot. Or okay. you can pull up a chair. What would you prefer? Let's see if uh, I'm a couch kind of guy. Oh, oh you're no. out of the shot now. You're going to have Damn to move man. a little bit that way. Oh, that way. Okay, I'll sit. Look at that. Say hello to Bob Marley, everybody. Hello. Oh. Hey, Carmine. What's new in the World Wide Web? It's good. Hey, so Matt, can you help? Tim Tim says, hit, uh, hit Matt at support at Produce Like a Pro. Um, hey, everybody says, hey, Bob, says Lem. Hi, Bob, says Connor. Hi, you... guys. How's life treating you? Are you good? I'm very good. You're looking very well. Eric's going to pick up the boys. Beautiful, beautiful. So that's good. Fantastic. We're actually just talking, we put up a video where we took a little bit this week. We put, took a little snippet of you mixing some rock guitars. Ah. I don't know if anybody, uh, anybody hit you up about it. I don't know. I'm... <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, actually, there's exciting. Uh, we're uh, revamping a lot of the cool stuff. Great. Because I just bought a bunch of new vintage cool amps and things. Oh, vintage cool amps. Yeah, I bought a um, uh, late 60s. I think it's late 60s. Vibrolux. Or Vibratone. Does this got anything to do with the fact that you just got a nice big sound exchange check? <laughs> Life is good. <laughs> and, uh, what was that? That was for Shine Down. Congratulations. Yes, thank you very much. Shine so you, Down and see their kind of but you, together. Am I right in saying this? Because I've told people this time. You, you, you were in the ground floor with Shine Down, getting the oh, yeah. and everything. Before so you, there was a band. Before there was a band. It was just Brent and myself, and I remember having that conversation. That's like, you know, for this to work in that world, you know, we got to come up with a band so great we put the band together as we were making the record <laughs> so listen to that yeah. you everybody's everybody's asking about how do you how do you create a career well there you go that's how you create careers right <laughs> you, you know what it, it's it's kind of really all about just gut instinct you just sort yep. of you know hey you know what we ought to do is this and then you just figure out how to do it you know and fortitude a lot of it's ported. Yeah. When, well, when everybody says go home, you stay and you just work and work until you get it. So well, like I, I mean, I, I hope in five years' time we'll be having the same conversation about the Matthews. Absolutely. Talking about how massively successful that was. Yes. I, mean, I started working with Jack when he was fifteen, and as of March he turned twenty. Ah. He was just about to turn sixteen, so it's been only slightly over four years, right, but yeah. yeah. Over four years, but again, and here we are. That's the process. It takes time, and you got to yep. kind of, you know, you just stay. If you if you got that feeling, that gut, that little thing, if you got that thing, you go. Well, once you, you know meet what? him, you'll just be like floored because yeah. he's six foot three. Yeah, like super skinny and devastatingly handsome. No, I know. With I that know. voice, so. <laughs> I tell you know, listen honestly. From the first time you played it for me, yeah, I was like, I'm in. Yeah, you no, know. it's just what a voice. Yeah. Was, and, and and I Capital heard it and, and Flynn, if he's watching, I was texting with him earlier. You know, my hat's gonna be off to him. If if they get successful, no, not if. When they get successful, win. when more of a win. Uh, when they get successful, I will give him a nod because he was one of the few people that heard them and went, Oh, this is amazing. He yeah. goes and he went to Capital America, which was run by Steve Barnett, who's English, and he said, This is fantastic, but 
we have to get the UK to sign it directly and then right. filter through us because they're an Irish band. Sure, sure. But then luckily, and we had a few people with similar reactions, but he was the first person that really got it and then, but couldn't sign them. But then it wasn't until you came on board and you just, it's just because they're a rock band, I was hitting all these pop people. Right. And that what's sad is when I say pop people, I'm including Atlantic. Right. Right. Yeah. Isn't that scary? Yeah. That the greatest rock label of all time, sure. Atlantic Records, yeah. doesn't really have a presence in rock. <coughs> yeah. They have Times Zeppelin's have catalog. Times have changed. Times have changed. Yeah. And it's no disrespect, but that's our business. That's where we're at. But it's okay because the, the you know the nature of what we do is cyclical. Yeah. It is. It always has been. You know. It's like. You know, it's like, and, and sometimes people go, how do you know? And it's like, well, if it's down here and something else is here, yeah, <laughs> it just keeps going like this. You just got to know where you're at in the cycle and, you know, and, and get timing, yeah. you know, because a lot of it is the analogy of the, the wave analogy. Yeah. Hey, if you're riding a wave, if you're, if you're too far out front, you fall right off. Yeah. Or... If you don't catch the wave, you paddle forever, but you you miss the wave. It's all about getting the timing of the getting right on the crest and ride that all the way in. Not not that I'm a surfer. I'm not right. known for <laughs> my surfing skills. Nor am I, actually. You know, I'm pretty English. If I go anywhere near the sun, I get completely. Um, if I if I go near the sun, I get completely and utterly burned. Do you, so me and do you surfing. remember Al Stewart? Of course. Okay. Year of the Cat. Year of the Cat, time yeah. passes. Well, I used to play piano for him when I was a kid. That was one of my first, you know, nice. early, early big gigs was I p played piano for him on a couple of records in uh, live. And when I was driving up here, you know that house, right when you turn on local <coughs> and you go one block and then there's that kind of tall kind of house right on that corner? Al Stewart's manager used to own that house. And that's so what we love we about did. Laurel Canyon. That's where we always used to stage before we'd leave out on tour is in that house. And then, you know, everybody would pick us up. And, well, it's like isn't that I, crazy. <laughs> absolutely. I remember I when I well, first of all, I bought this house from a friend of mine um, who's Chad Fisher, who right. does the music for um, private practice and scandal right. and and, and it, it really, really successful. But he was in a band called um, School of Fish, right from oh, Boston. Yeah. He was the drummer. Yeah. He was also in Lisa Loeb's Nine Stories. He was the drummer in there, and then he had a band called um, Laszlo Bain, which was basically him. And he did all the albums in this room. And he up the street, Zach Braff lives, and he did uh, the theme tune for I'm No Superman. You know, from, oh yeah, yeah, that's him. That's Chad singing and playing oh, no all the instruments. I love that. Song. Yeah. So he did that um, for what was that? What was that show called? Was that Braff? Scrubs. Uh, yeah, Scrubs. Scrubs. And then he did... My some... son and I watched that show, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> and then he did uh, Shrek. He did... Uh, he's doing... Uh, he did a cover of Alone Again, Naturally, which is in Shrek, you know, when the... Right. When the... Uh, when the two kind of squirrels are trying to fight the male and female are trying to fight over right, the... Right, right. Fight over the acorn. Right. And then eventually the girl steals the acorn from him and goes back to Alone Again, Naturally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... At, and then, but I remember, so that was my earliest, first, earliest memory. And then my friend Louise lived two doors up. Um, Irene Mecky, who wrote The Lion King, was next, next door. But then the house up from that was Louise's house, which is now Jono's house, who's Dave Stewart's right-hand man. Right. And in that house was Louise. And I'd known her from England. And I come here and I'm like, this is like everything sort of comes together. Like Louise Goffin, who, of course, is Carol King's daughter, lives right. there. Josh Clayton felt lived in her, God rest his soul, he died um, super young but he lived there he was the singer of school of fish right. and he was working and touring with tori amos in those days i just remember everything about this area mm -hmm. and then the house on the corner as you come up is on the with the with the concrete is mm -hmm. zappa's first laurel canyon yeah. house frank zappa's house yeah it's like it's crazy it's awesome although i must admit i was somewhat cursing you today as traffic I'm driving all the way here kind of going but it really is more of a statement of how spoiled I am that I, you know, <laughs> right. I never seem to leave my property. So, right. Know, the older I get, the more I don't want to leave. <laughs> I yeah. The gates open and I start to now. Nah. <laughs> Close the gates. 
No, I hear you. Well, we, we get pretty similar. I mean, picking up the boys, um, which is the Irish guys from last night from, um, from the airport, took them to Cantor's to get some uh, dinner, like you do. Uh, for those of you who know LA, that's uh, an institution for all musicians, especially with the Thursday nights, the jam. Their bands have got signed from that yeah. thing back in the 80s. Sure. Artists would get signed from their uh, kibitz room. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Johnny Depp was discovered playing the kibitz room. This is real. Was playing the kibitz room because he came out with his friend Bruce Whitkin. They came out together, bass player and guitar player. They, did, they were playing there one night, and at, he came outside with his guitar on his back, hanging outside and a casting director came up to him and said, oh, I'm casting this new TV show, which, uh, what was it called? Um, 90642. Or no, he wasn't in there. It was in... Um, I forget. It was made into a movie. Um, Somebody will know. <laughs> uh, it's, it was the two kids that were like a high school that were uh, detectives. Anyway, you all, you all know the show. It's going to come up in a minute. Anyway, and this casting director says you'd be perfect for it and gave him the card. He called up and he came out as a musician. Yeah. So he's not like in a band now, um, you know. Yeah, Joni has, still has two houses she rents out. 21 Jump Street. Everybody's got it. 20 ah, 21. 21 Jump Street. Thank you. Yeah. See? So, so he, got, he got it from there. So anyway, so I do all of that. And then I take him. They're in like East Hollywood. And I was like, I haven't been to East Hollywood or any, like, the real world where up-and-coming musicians now stay and live. What they always did. Right. I haven't been there in, like, ten years. I've been sure. so spoiled. I'm on the west side. You know, we go, we go like, go to West Hollywood and Beverly Hills and Studio City to eat. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but this is, like, that's where all the musicians live. Like, everybody was always in, like, East Hollywood. And I'm just very lucky because I think the best Indian restaurant in Los Angeles is right up the street from There you go. I told the boys about that yesterday. Where? Oh, good. Okay, good. Because it's, it's got my Italian, my Indian, and a few other sprinkles, my diner. <laughs> right. All good. I'm not sure where the message getting deleted is coming from. Some random ones. Nicholas Cage got him into movies. Yeah. Yeah, all I know is the story that Johnny said because we were doing um we were doing uh that Aerosmith album in 2011 and my old studio was Tim Burton's old um uh, studio. So it was this big 8500 or 8000 square foot building and what had happened was they had filmed well, basically, it was a model making area. It was a huge warehouse, and he lived in the back. And it had a bedroom and a shower, a huge walk in shower, and a kitchen and everything. And Tim lived in that. But then the other, like, 7,000 square feet was all just model making and areas where he filmed. So he would make, he would do, like, the animated stuff in there and film it. And also, it's where they filmed um, um, Ed Wood. And so, you know, I love it. yeah, the movie's fantastic. They filmed it in there. So when we came in, and tra um, Johnny came in and sang some backgrounds on it and we ha came and hung out a half a dozen times. He was a great guy and always come in very humble and come in and just want to be in a room with Joe and, and Stephen and stuff like that. Just a great, great energy to have in a room. Super positive person. I can see that's why he works so much because when he's with you, he makes everybody feel really good. So he comes in and he comes in and the first thing, he's kind of in shock and he's like, I know this building. This is where I filmed Ed Wood. This is where Tim made all his models. This is where we did all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, that we got the, the building from, from Tim Burton. So just a really, really good energy. So he's the one that told us about being a guitar player and coming out here to be guitars. He also told Stephen and Joe that he would make Aerosmith t-shirts, fake ones, when he was 13 in Florida. <laughs> And at the beginning, and it shows he would sell out of the back of, of, of like a friend's car, an older brother's friend or whatever, I don't remember. Right. He would sell these fake made, homemade Aerosmith t-shirts to make money. So he was like, I used to rip you guys off to make some money. It was pretty funny. I love that. There was a lot of other stories he told, which are probably not repeatable on camera. I'll tell you later. Yeah, right. But um, anyway, but yeah, pretty, pretty funny. Yeah, exactly. It was about, uh, um, yeah. Edward, yeah, you know the story that Boris Karloff do dies during the making of the movie, and then they bring in a second guy, and Boris was like 6'4 or something, was super tall and skinny, and this vampire, and they brought in this little Latino guy, who was like 5'7 or something, 
So, so half the movie in pla uh, in uh, in the uh, what was the movie that had him in? Was it Plan Nine of Outer Space? Or I don't remember which movie it was. Whatever the I don't remember which yes. movie it was. But yeah, so half the movie has Boris Karloff as like this giant, and then the other half has this little guy. <laughs> That's just like yeah <laughs> incredible uh oh more great great guitar players yeah rory gallagher absolutely incredible anyway thank you for staying in thanks for bob coming in we're going to sign off um so matt has said the join the monthly he said these are the types of conversations that you'll hear inside the company okay so the join the monthly so matt did you put the uh monthly link up so yes, and uh, Matt's saying this is basically what we do. This is our academy conversations. You'll get to hear more of this. So Lugosi, yes, thank you. Yeah, Bella Lugosi, you're right. Not Boris Karloff. My fault. Yeah, Bella close, Lugosi. Though. You were close. Yeah, I was close. I, I messed it up. You are 100% correct. It's Bella Lugosi, not Boris Karloff. Yes. So the monthly membership. So there it is. Um, can you email me? Can I email you for prices? Well, email support at producelikeapro.com. I get that, and also Matt does as well. And Matt can Matt and I can both answer. I try my hardest to answer every single one that I get. Thank you. Um, um, monthly, you can get out of any time. I don't know why, Matt. We've got to figure out what the what the why these messages are getting deleted because we're not deleting them. It says, are we locked into a monthly or yearly forever? No, we're not. You're not locked in. Um, uh, and um, yeah, it says it's get it's doing a weird thing. YouTube's doing a weird kind of deleting things the way it wants. Um, national security. Yeah, national security. Yes, <laughs> I think it's because Bob Marlette's here. Probably. Now that the whole like level is raised, <laughs> it's like I think he's dressed in black because he's actually an FBI member. I think and he came in with the glasses on. You know, um, at the moment. So. There, there was an actual. He actually came in a cavalcade. Yeah. The whole of Laurel Canyon is currently blocked off with right. Cadillacs. Yeah. There's yeah. like loads of Cadillacs SUVs and black cap windows. And SUVs and, all yeah. down the street. All joking aside, we had uh, when when um, when uh, Carrie Underwood came up here to sing. Right. She came up here and sang uh, um, a duet with Stephen, Stephen Tyler, and she came in. It was three Escalades with blacked out windows for real. And with a bodyguard, it was like an English guy, very, really sweet guy. But yeah, she came in with like three, and then Stephen pulled up behind her in a Hennessy, in a black convertible Hennessy. You know those cars? It's the arguably the fastest car in the world. It has right. an F three fifty four truck engine in it that's been modified. <laughs> but it's this, and it's a Lotus Elise, I believe, that's cut in half and stretched. So it's this little tiny Lotus stretched with this huge engine in, right. and so we had. It was insane. So basically, it was early evening, and like half of my neighbors were out, like, what's going on? Yeah. You know, three like huge escalades and like this <laughs> rattling kind of thing. Because in the canyon here, anything that's loud echoes. Sure, sure. So, like on the on the on the Laurel Canyon residence page, all these people were like, What was that sound? Yeah. Did you hear that? It sounded like the most <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you're not already a member of the Academy, please join. You'll get a lot more of these fun um, conversations. And um, Matt is going to put that up underneath the um, also underneath the video. So please check it out. Um, um, we are doing a podcast. We are going to be doing that. We, we sort of stopped it for a while because we got so overwhelmed. We've got a new, some new guys coming in to work, so they'll be taking a lot of our stuff and editing and putting up on the podcast. That will be pushed a little bit more heavily. Um, thank you, uh, Mac DSP. Thank you also, Plugin Alliance, but obviously especially thank you for Mac DSP for giving us free plugins. That is not staged. We don't, just so you guys know, we don't talk about it in advance. They just get on there and they get generous. That is what's so wonderful about what we do here. That's why I was pointing out that we have 196 um, thousand subscribers now it's absolutely insane what an amazing community you are you all rock thank you so much if you haven't got Bob's course yet go check it out it's as far as rocks mixing is concerned and production stuff it might be the best out there by far check it out Matt please put up a link to Bob's course thank you Bob for just arriving my pleasure my ple <laughs> we've also got a lot of other fun stuff coming out with Bob um, same bat time, same bat channel, exactly. You all, all rock. I'm going to stop the live streaming. See you all again very soon. Have a marvelous...